Robert Bowen Butler has published 17 novels, six volumes of short fiction, including the 1993 Pulitzer Prize winner, A Good Sit from a Strange Mountain, as well as a guide to the creative process from where, from where you dream. In 2013, he received the F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for Outstanding Achievement in American Literature. Currently, he's a distinguished professor in creative writing at Florida State University. Please join me in welcoming Robert Holden. Oh, thank you very much. Delighted to uh, have you all here. Um, so, yes, this is about the literary genre that I'll be talking today. Um, and uh, if you know my work, uh, it might sound odd because I've written everything from a wild fantasy set entirely in hell, hell to uh, Oprah. Book of the Week that she called the Old Fashioned Romance. And um, uh, you know, I've, I've written four books in a row here. I threw in the literary genre in the midst of them, but uh, um, four books that are, um, could be classified as historical espionage thrillers. So, but in all cases, um, I would be able to suggest that they were also literary. And there are books then whose literariness are the, you know, the, the presiding and un unadulterated, I don't mean that in a bad sense, um, a feature of, of the books. So, but today I want to I want to focus at least in initial remarks here. We've got, what, an hour and a quarter? So I'm going to talk to you maybe for half an hour or so um, try to keep it fairly condensed, but outline um, what I understand to be literariness. What is it that makes an object on the page a work of art? And how indeed does that come to be? And what happens in the writer who, um, who, uh, who wishes for that to be, needs for that to be? You don't mind if I sit down sometimes. And about uh, four years ago, I turned instantly from age 31 to age 70. For <laughs> <laughs> a meniscus in my right knee, running two at a time up the steep steps of the Atlanta airport. <laughs> Went on for two weeks in Shanghai with uh, uh, a bad knee. And, uh, you know, I've been. Uh, Usually reminded of my mortality, so, <laughs> so I will. I love to pace around. I will do some of that, but I'm also going to sit. So I'm sorry. You don't need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, the fact is that um, the, the the things that make something literary is what I'm going to try to get at in as clearly as I can. I've been teaching for 35 years in graduate programs in creative writing. And I've seen thousands and thousands of manuscripts <laughs> of students who are aspiring to write in this genre. Most of, and I'm just having a discussion with my old friend here uh, before we began, uh, that there are some MFA programs now, I think, that are catering, and I don't, yeah, I don't mean anything majority by that word, but hope, you know, helping to, to uh, uh, nourish and nurture writers who work, want to work in the entertainment genres, uh, pure entertainment genres in the MFA area, but now we've got 40 or 50 schools, because they're free to do that. It was once that the MFA was really strictly university as well. But now because there are probably 50 at least major universities offering PhDs in creative writing, including our own, mine, FSU, or State University, uh, they have co-opted that enough that there are some MFAs out there helping you do that. And in, your Q, in the Q&A at the back end of this, the last half of today, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on any genre, about anything in writing you think I might be able to help you, okay? But I always, if all these years when people are sitting before me aspiring to write literary fiction, I find that, that given certain reasons, the way they've been taught to read literature, for example, the way they have been taught to write, 
They know the second through the tenth things about what the literary, the literary process is about, the artistic process, and they don't know the first thing about it. I'm going to get at the first principle. And I have traditionally begun, I'm going to jump up and sit down. <laughs> uh, the, one of the first things I do is I like to, um, to quote the great Japanese film director, Akira Kurosawa, who once said that to be an artist means never to avert your eyes. And I think this is profoundly true. And the question is, avert your eyes from what? And, and in answering that question, we have to, uh, and that really does lead us to, to what it is that makes an artist do what she does. We all exist on this planet, in our bodies, in our senses. That is a, a primary mode of being. And insofar as that's the case, we encounter the world. And by the way, our feelings are not just creatures of the mind. We are creatures of our emotions and our bodies. In fact, those drive most of the rest of it. Uh, and the, 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 the realities that we encounter in our bodies, if you, if you do not rely on the modes of thought and, and belief that are provided to us by other institutions, if you are in your body, in the moment, in your feelings, there are many moments, frequently, that you have a sense that all is chaos that our, our lives are not in our conscious or even unconscious control sometimes. And that we are always in the process of facing the forces and darkness and realities about our human nature that are going to overwhelm us. And, um, The, the modes of belief that I just mentioned to you, those are, the, those are the folks who also understand, try to understand, believe they understand. What they, that behind that chaos, there's some kind of order, okay? Mm -hmm. Philosophers, theologians, uh, psychiatrists, scientists, lots of folks believe the world makes sense. It's not the chaos think it is just in our emoting sense based moment to moment lives. And so those folks, however, that I name, that believe that the world makes sense, they believe the way that they understand that it makes sense, and certainly the ways that they are comfortable in uh, articulating that understanding has to do with doing it through ideas, through abstraction, religious dogma, and philosophical principles, and, you know, psychoanalytic insights, scientific law. Those, all the folks and there are many others, kinds of people who believe that the world makes sense in that way, and to express it that way. And, and the artist, however, finds those, those, and by the way, those things are very reassuring. Sure. You, know, you the, the great credence that can be given to that in our individual lives is that we, we visit those philosophies, those theories, those dogmas, and we draw um, some conf confidence and some comfort that, okay, it makes sense. It really does. It's operating by these principles. But all of those things are matters of the mind. They're matters of abstraction, an idea. The artist has a deep conviction her ongoing engagement 
with the moment-to-moment life. And Kurt Kurosawa refusing to avert her eyes from that chaos. That artist, that nascent artist, in the face of the chaos, nevertheless has some deep, innate intuition that the appearance of chaos is wrong, that indeed there is sense here, that there is something to understand, that 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 can pull things together, that can reassure us that at least that that there are patterns that that implicitly um, organize what otherwise seems utterly unlikely. But the artist, and this is what this is what distinguishes the artist, um, the artist in, in, in her discomfort with the answers that are abstract and analytical and theoretical and so forth, that this, this understanding is driven back, the artist is driven back in order to not only express but even to understand that order, they are driven back to the way in which we live in the moment and through our senses. That, that, that you take the stuff of that primary experience, the moment-to-moment sense details in time, and you extract them, you select them into this artistic object. And in the, in the gathering together of this object, and to make all of those individual sensual pieces fit harmoniously together, that process then creates an object which you encounter in a different way from the ways that you're expected to encounter those philosophies that um, that would have us understand the order as idea and abstraction. That the object that's created because it's organic, because the sensual patterning of the object makes, the, makes all these individual pieces that are usually the source of our discomfort and our fear and our dread, that, the, that those pieces suddenly begin to resonate together. And it's an a absolutely different kind of experience. Um, and so, um, ultimately, the, the, the principle here is that the objects that artists create and the insight and understanding of, of, the, of the essence of our human condition that it does not come from here. It does not come from our analytical faculties. That art comes from, that's the name of my book on the process, it comes from the place where you dream. It does not come from your literal dreams. I'm not talking about dreaming something and writing it down and creating a piece of fiction. But it's in the same place in our consciousness, in our sentience, in our being. But that's where these these elements come from. Um, and so, um, this is the kind of the, this is the, the, the difference in the mode of approach between artists and everybody else. Um, now, it's not an easy thing. And um, one of the reasons it's not an easy thing, even if you, if what I just said to you makes some kind of sense, even if your own sense of art um, fits into that in some inchoate way, it is still incredibly difficult for people who aspire to be artists to write, to do this. And there, and there, and there are some, there are some good 
fairly obvious reasons for that. One of, one of the difficulties is um, the medium of language. Right? Literary artists have the, the problem of losing track of aspiring literary artists, of losing track of the essence of their, of their art. They are more prone to this than the other art forms. Because no matter how much thinking, how much a visual artist or a composer or a choreographer or a dancer or whoever, be, no matter how those folks get, might have their brains interfering with them, ultimately, when they then they, when they turn to creating their, their art, the medium itself refuses to let them stay in their brains. To the degree that they do stay in their brains, they're going to screw up their art, yes. But it's harder to, to, to do that because they let their you know, you know, movement in dance, sound in music, color and form in painting, most of that's the medium. And those things are in any, you know, irreducibly of the senses. So they're going to produce an object of the senses, no matter where they are in their brain. Now, if they're up here, they're going to mess that up. But at least the object itself, the medium itself, is trying to drag the would-be artists into the right place in themselves to create. <clears throat> But folks in the literary art, we've got a special problem. Because our medium on the page is on the page and it's in language, it's words. The fact is, unlike movement and sound and color and shape, words are not intrinsically and inevitably and inexorably of the senses. On the contrary, most of the words we have are in their purest form utterly unsensual. They are abstract. That's and, and necessarily so given the uses, most common uses of language. They are on the uh, uh, they are abstract, they are right? ideational, they are summarizing, they are labeling. All of those verbs are death to a work of art. So it's not surprising that even if I've had over 35 years, so many students come to me deeply, who didn't know how to respond to works of art, what I say here makes sense to them, and then they, they try to do it, it is profoundly difficult. And that's the first reason is because that the art form they're working in is working against them in some fundamental way from the get-go. The second reason it's so difficult uh, for them is, is because of the way they will learn to read. <laughs> and by the way, I teach in a PhD program, the way they were taught to write, well, write in, as an undergraduate, but even write in a literary form, honestly. We'll talk about that later. <coughs> but when you go into, but let's look at the, the way you're taught to read the kinds of works you therefore wish to aspire to create. Literature. How many literature teachers do we have? <laughs> you probably accept this and you're going to get me on. Oh, fun one's finally. It's all right. But here's the problem. How are you doing? Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit and talk about, I've talked about here trying to describe the, 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 the appropriate attitude about the artist creating the work of art. And 
in, in terms of the, the life experience and trying to make sense of in this non-rational way, this, this aesthetic way, as opposed to an analytical way. So here they are in literature classes, and maybe, you know, and they've, they've discovered reading along the way, and they've had this deep connection to it, and they go off and like, really now learn how, all about it. The reader's appropriate natural response to a work of literature, when you when you read it, you are you are not meant in the in the primary and only necessary engagement as a reader with the work of literary art. You are not meant to understand it, to experience it in an abstract analytical, theoretical, thematic, symbolic, probably some other <laughs> perversions you can put in. <laughs> Wait, that is not what you're supposed to do. As a reader of a work of literature, you, your primary and only necessary response to a work of art is to thrum to it. Like a string vibrating on a string instrument. You are meant to thrum. But in part, thrum. Thrum. T H R U M. Thrum. And I'm doing this because that's a string, a string on a string instrument. <laughs> now, if that's the aesthetic response, if that's if that's the way in which we are meant to engage with the work of art, because indeed is the way we inevitably must engage with that moment-to-moment -moment sensual life out there, that's what scares the hell out of us. It's because we're not in the moment-to-moment -moment encounter with life, pulling out the themes and pulling out the ideas as we live, we may be trying to, but that doesn't work when you really face the existential dread of what this life is about, okay? And so, you go into a literature class and they're gonna help you But the expectation is to, to begin to then examine literature in the, in, the, in the manners of their techniques and their themes and their symbols and the, and the, the, you know, the larger historical context and the, the political and the, the, the climate and the, the philosophical modes of thought and latent here and you know, all those ways. So, first of all, you give the students the impression, implicit in that, explicit really, is that that is what the literature is about. In fact, it's, you know, what is the author trying to say? You heard that in the class? <laughs> trying has not said it yet. But will have said it once we translate it into these ideas and thoughts and things. Okay. So, given that, how does the, and, and given that the students' success in the class, the students' understanding that they are learning and becoming educated and finding their way to the depths of literature, when they begin to read the works on that reading list, which are indeed wonderful works of art, from the first sentence they begin to read, what is their experience of reading that book? They're looking for what those things are doing here. Where do they exist? How do they fit together? It's from here. 
The thrum stops, never starts. I'm going to give you a quote out of context here because it, it, it's relevant elsewhere, but it's also relevant in terms of how I can sometimes stumble around here. Graham Greene, the great British novelist, once, great, once said, and I'm quote, paraphrasing, because I can't remember the quote for reasonable. He immediately, obviously, he said, all good novelists have bad memories. <laughs> he says, what you remember comes out of journalism. What you forget goes into the compost of the imagination. Okay? So I've got a pretty useful good almost bad memory. And I'm going to, and, and trying to tell you all a whole bunch of complicated stuff in fairly condensed time, I will sometimes, and I've never said all this the same way twice, um, I'm going to start progressing a little bit. I may have to say, okay, what was I saying? Okay, so be ready to tell me. So what was I saying? Okay. Um, so anyway. Um, the, uh, the digression I want to make now, I'm going to pull back the literature a minute. Let's talk about writing workshops. How many of you have actually been in this one? What about? Mm -hmm. You have the same danger there. Same danger. Because the classic model of teaching creative writing is every bit as destructive and, and contributory to uh, the problems that students have about, about, their, about getting at a work of art is because it has its own equivalent of that. You know, sit in a great circle, and there's an eminent or semi eminent writer in the room, certainly the authority key figure in the room about this stuff. And, um, and in almost every classroom, the authority figure there is it's it's not that they're geniuses of pedagogy, it's that they they've well written published things, okay? <laughs> but the workshop format is tailor made for people teaching something when they don't necessarily know how to teach. In fact, the better they are, the less they're likely to be able to step back and analyze themselves. It's like schizophrenia, you know? You'd be, the bird has to be the ornithologist. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not easy for birds. <laughs> and so the workshop was born where you have the, 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 you hold up the beautiful principle of pure criticism. The blind leading the potentially sighted. And since even the Let's put aside the little rivalries and jealousies and gotchas and get your backs that go on. Put those aside. Even with good intentions to help your fellow students. And, of course, impressed by your critical acumen, which the workshop was relying on, impress the teacher in the room for whom your grade is dependent and certainly for whom your, your future blurb on your book is dependent to impress that teacher and to help your fellow students, even that. You get a manuscript in your hands written by somebody in the room and that manuscript, let's say, as often is, inspires to be a work of art. And you take it home, you're going to read it, you're going to make comments on it for next week. When you sit down with that to read it, how are you going to read it? From the first sentence, what am I going to say? Now, the talk, the kind of criticism that you give each other, and indeed, the kind of criticism that the writer in the room is most likely to be comfortable with teaching, has to do with focus on craft and technique. Not the artistic process, which I'm stumbling around trying to get to you today. Craft and technique is the writing workshops, the 
equivalent of theme, symbol, you know, literary history, blah, blah, right? It's the, it's the stuff of the head. It's the stuff <coughs> of the will in the creation of the world. Do you understand how far we've now traveled from your even getting even probably from the writer in the room, a legitimate examination of where you stand and what you're producing as an artist. So no wonder my students struggle with this, because this is what they've gone through for sometimes years, a PhD program. They go through four years as lit majors and three years in the MFA program, and all they've ever heard was the abstract stuff, extracting the techniques and craft, extracting you know the themes and the symbols. Um, those are good reasons why this is a, a slippery concept, and why I'm emphasizing it here today. So that this is the crucial thing. There's one other reason it's hard. Because what, what we're demanding of an artist is to, you know, right from your white hot center, from your deep composted experience, from the place in you where you are most keenly aware of the chaos of the human condition, unprotected by any kind of outside philosophies or whatever. So why then is the aspiring artist having trouble getting there? Because that's scary as hell. It's scary as hell. You can't go there without scaring the hell out of yourself. Remember when I turned 70 year old son. <laughs> Since then, I have written what a lot of viewers feel are two of my very best books called Perfume River in the literary genre, Paris in the Dark, which is the, the fourth of, you know, Graham Greene called these entertainments in his genre, but frankly, the Stamble Train. Quite American art, every, every bit is literary. Maybe some of the best literary world. Okay, but I read two of my best books of the twenty-five books I've written since I turned seven. And in those years, and up to the last week and a half, I've had a particularly bad bout of it. I am, I am, I alternate between horrific existential dread, which my good novel is bad memory mostly protected me from in my moment-to-moment -moment life before that. I no longer protect it somehow. And, and, and alternating, bizarrely, from the same, because I'm just more present in the moment. The, the process, my unconscious has always been present. I'm taking the stuff in intensely. But I'm forgetting it almost instantly. Useful. <laughs> forgetting it in the uh oh, put that together with what happened 10 minutes ago, and you know, you're going to die <laughs> sooner rather than later. <laughs> well, that's starting to break down, okay? I'm still as good, but. Uh, you know, on the back end where I'm writing, I'm pulling that stuff, but in the moment to moment, I'm, you know. But, but the irony is, and the, 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 the tell is that all I have to do is kind of, you know, all I have to do is not easy, but the slough off to shut. And one of the reasons it's going on so intensely right now is that I'm, I've been, I'm in the midst of my new, newest novel, which is going to be the best one ever. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and I'm about to do Get me back, okay? Because I'm about to say, because the, the, what happens here in this novel is that uh, two hours after Donald Trump 
King Trump is declared president of the United States. The last living World War I veteran begins to die in a nursing home in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. That's the premise of my new novel. And it all happens, it's like, you know my book, Severance? Yes. Yeah, where, where I write the last minute and a half of consciousness in a recently severed head. 62 pieces. This is like a 70,000, 80,000 word severance piece. It all takes place in the, you know, in basically in a few nanoseconds. This is the death. But what happens is this man's 115 and a half years life flash before him in a highly condensed way. Now, for a guy who tore his meniscus going to Shanghai and suddenly became an old man, inhabiting such a character. It's a daunting thing if you go into the place in yourself where art comes from. You could well imagine. The irony is being able to do that and doing and and my problem the last last month and a half is that and I knew this was going to come. I had a period of time where I'm a lot on the road, doing other books, talking about old books, doing this and. Um, there's been some things that I've had to do in my quotidian life that the book got set aside for six weeks, and so I'm not writing every day, and I cannot vent off into that book the existential dread. You understand? Though in my unconscious, it is the thing most dynamically at work. And so I toggle now, even in a day, even in five minutes from existential dread to something rather like existential joy, right? But I've got to keep thinking, I'm present, this present's good. I'm present, holy shit, I'm present, you know? Look, this is, if you're going to be an artist, you've got to live with this. And if you're going to get better and better as an artist, you've got to live with it even more intensely. That's what I'm doing. Now, where was I? <laughs> so, nobody remembers. You're all, you're all, you're all, you're all got potential. What do you mean? <laughs> One person remembers the bite hurts out of me. Because... <laughs> so, anyway, so there we are. That's, that's, that's the difficulty uh, that we face um, as aspiring writers. The, the, the language fights us, the ways we learn to read and write fight us. The fear fights us, all of which says, you know, you, you can play the safe. You don't hear it in these words, it just comes to you. You, you fall back on the ways you understand literature and writing in those bogus ways, because those ways are safe. If I can deal the next thing, and if I don't have to deal I don't have to go inside the fear and inside the chaos and find the unique, sensual, moment-to-moment -moment expression of that. If I can take what I know about literature, what I know about creative writing, and wheel those, that knowledge into a decision that I make in the book, in the story, then you don't have to deal with that deeper thing, the thing that you Kurosawa suggests you can't, you know, an artist don't avert their eyes from. Avert away and feel like you're writing. That's safe. Artists are not safe. And when they are least safe, the, the great paradox is when they are least safe, they are probably the most safe. What's kept me less, less safe in the last six weeks or so has been the fact that I am, I've been inevitably, I mean, just, you know, normally I don't give any excuse to anybody not to write every day. I, I, this, this has been a very unusual six weeks, so I, I understand why. Also, it's a, it's a, it's a, and I'm going to be on the panel tomorrow of uh, location. I want to argue that uh, the 
person sharing the panel may argue it on my behalf because I found the idea that, <laughs> the, that place is not just landscape, it's also you know, historic place and, and, and the routine is world place. And um, the book I'm writing, since it's you know, 115 years of history, American history, for me to inhabit the character properly in the moment through the senses, which is the way literature is written, I so much, you know, every, you know, I've said, okay, 3,000 words in, in his World War I career, and now, now he's out of the Army and gone to Chicago to become a newspaper reporter, and I've got to, I've got to suddenly understand journalism. I mean, the nuts and bolts day to day, moment to moment journalism and Chicago streets and what, you know, everything. So I'm also having to stop and do that research. And I try to do it through the, by like having a character, but you know, I'm going to go so far. Anyway, this is, this is what I'm struggling with. But that's what you, that's the deal. That's what you have to sign up for if you want to be a literary. Okay. Um, let me tell you one more basic thing about literature as art as narrative and um, utterly crucial in our We're going to 215. We'll have a good 20, 25 minutes for questions. This, this is really important. The thing I just said is just kind of the fundamental word. Oh, by the way, before I leave the literature professor, you guys do a great job. Even if you, even even if you, even if you teach the the themes and symbols and all of that stuff, I just ask you to do two things, and then all is forgiven. Not only forgiven, it will make you actually useful. <laughs> you must you must as your first. Observation in class, warn the students what we are doing. We're trying to teach you how to read a work of art, but what we are going to be mostly be saying in here, you have to understand, is a purely artificial and secondary activity. It's artificial and it's secondary. But we are going to do that. You have already talked about thrumming as the primary. <laughs> but the reason you're going to do that is that in doing it here in this class, we're going to add some, perhaps, but hopefully we'll add some, some new strings to your thrumming instrument. We'll add some in the upper registers and in the lower registers. So that after going through this class, you will thrum more harmoniously and completely to the work of art. Okay? With that caveat to begin with, go for it. But then, necessarily, you have to say at the back end, the last in class, now that we've done this artificial secondary thing, my final and most important assignment to you is this. Forget everything we said. <laughs> Never do this again. Unless you hope to be a teacher, <laughs> and then never do this while you're reading. <laughs> then no harm done. In fact, even some some thrumming usefulness done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's the deal. Here's what the essence of narrative is. All narrative, and there's a special wrinkle on it for um, the literary narrative. Every art form has certain characteristics that you cannot escape. We've already talked about it. Movement, dance, sound, sound and music too, right? Fiction has a few things. It, it has that medium of language, that's necessary. But there are a few other things. First of all, fiction is about human beings. No? Even if it happens to be a parrot. Um, or a giant cockroach, right? So, but it's still about humans. And, and, and it's about human feeling. It's about emotion. 
But there's another thing that fiction inevitably is about. Fiction is a temporal art form. It exists in time. A poem, also an art form of language, does not have to exist in time. You can have a thing, poem about a chair. There's no passage of time in the, in the event of the poem itself. No? But if you let the line link run on and you turn the page, you are, as they used to say, upon a time. And any Buddhist will tell you, it's one of the great truths of their religion, that as a human being with feelings on planet Earth, you cannot exist for even 30 seconds of time without desiring something. We are creatures of desire, great and small. And in the class, the craft technique classes, it's objectives, super objectives. No, the characters are after someone. And I, for the literary genre, my preference is to, is to use the word yearning because it suggests the deepest level of desire, of objective. Fiction is the, because it's a narrative art form, fiction is the art form of human yearning. And indeed, let's go back to the most fundamental of craft notions in fiction, plot. What is plot? Plot is yearning, challenged and thwarted. I yearn for something. Something happens, I cannot get it. I've got to go around the problem, through it, and so forth. And that is, you know, that's the essence, okay? So, if you do not establish the DNA, at least, of the character's yearning from the get-go, because a work of art is all organic, if you 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 are not you are not writing effectively as a as a narrative really writer. Would you repeat that? That last uh, part. And also, uh, it's what well, it's yearning um, challenge. Challenge. Yeah, plot is. Plot is yearning, challenged and thwarted. Yeah. By the way, all of this is in my book from what you're reading. In fact, that's basically my original lecture story. Right <laughs> my Graham Greene and good bad memory. I haven't, I haven't said this for in a long time. Why well, keep looking at my notes and going, what the hell would I mean by that? So, um, so yeah. But, um, so. Where was it? Uh, yeah, so you know, you're, the yearning then is, is uh, at, you know, it, it, you have to have that in order to write the plot, the DNA. The DNA of it has to be there from the get go. I find that most writers, even, you know, in my PhD program and so forth, and I do my workshops a little different, obviously, a little differently from others, but the, the, the struggle here for them is that they are so used into, in, and almost all of the, the stories that come out of workshops and the novels even that come out of workshops, there's a, there's a seductive surrogate for yearning that doesn't really drive fiction, and that is the problem. It's, it's much easier to give a character problems, to write problems into the character's life in the ongoing story, than it is to write yearning. Problem does not, is not the same as yearning. Indeed, what problems are, are the challenges and thwartings to yearning, awaiting the yearning. So that however you're conceiving the problems for a character, and, and so those problems may be legitimate in your vision for the work, but if you, if, because it's, again, it's safer to just write the problems. It's one, when you engage and inhabit the character journeys, which are, which are so deep and, 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 and 
profound that those those challenges and warnings are, are deeply unsettling. That when you inhabit the character that way, it's it's gonna be it's gonna push you down into your unconscious in this place where you scare yourself. But if you just sit there and, and give the character problems without without engaging the deep yearning and necessities of that yearning, then it's not as threatening to you. Understand? Yeah. I just had a spirit of fiction. So if, if, that, if that's true, I can't write a story about a guy who's being attacked by somebody with a gun. Right. But I can about the guy with the gun because he might learn, he might really have a need uh, that's urgent. Yeah, but there's a, there, yeah, and, and it's likely that in the literary story, unless the guy with the gun, there's a, a deeper connection between the two of them. I mean, you, you don't, either one, you still got the same problem. But, uh, but yeah, well, let's get that, let me just finish this up and then we can get to some of the final questions. Um, so, the reason, the reason that this is, again, so, um, I, I've, been, I've been struggling with this, and even in, even in From Where You Dream, I don't make this quite as clear. This is something special. Um, I've come to realize, I think, in the last several years, that, that there is what, to borrow a phrase from Einstein, a kind of unified field theory of yearning that we can describe you know, in, in literary fiction. That I think if you look deep enough into any, into the central character, the, the driving narrative character in a, in a work of fiction, if you look deep enough into that character, you're gonna find that the character's yearning is this. I yearn for a self. I yearn for an identity. I yearn for a place in the universe. If you dig deep enough into every great literary work, I think you will, you will find your way down to that being. That's a nice thing to look for in literature classes. That being the, the, the thing that is driving the character and the living mirror. The reason it's that is that is what human life is about, I would suggest. That every, every yearning soul in this room and in this planet, that is the fundamental thing that we are yearning for. And if you think about all the flashpoints of identity in this character, of all the flashpoints in our culture, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, politics, uh, what else? You know, you can add to that list a little bit, but there they are, right? What are, uh, what are our own things? They are, take a step back. They are all pre, pre, uh, prefabricated answers to that question. Who am I? What is my identity? What's my place in the universe? Well, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm straight, I'm gay, I'm um, a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm, you know, um, I'm, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Jew, I'm a Christian, I'm an atheist. It's all, you know, those are the answers to the thing, those are the, you know, the opportunities and the stumbling blocks and the thwartings, and the ways around some thwartings, who knows, but those, those things are, are, are not the end issue. The issue is we are all trying to figure out who we are. Poor Donald Trump, two in the morning, tweeting away. <laughs> he does not have an answer to that question. He tells, He's told what, 8,000 lies in the last two years? 92% of them. He's trying, he's desperately trying to float a theory out there about who the hell he is. He does not have a clue. But at his heart, he is one raw yearning for an identity.
for a self, for a place in the universe. Name your favorite Democrat, it's going on there too. The people you love the most and the people you hate the most, we are one in that. Which is why the great literary art form exists on that. What drives a narrative in a literary work? It's the great, who the hell am I? I have, I yearn to answer that question. Yeah. Isn't yearning in the heart, the soul, the mind, all, all those things? Or? All those things, but the mind, yeah, the mind works at it, but, but the, 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 the modes of discourse that the mind is particularly fond of answering those questions in is inappropriate work of art. Except with, by the way, characters can think in works of art. But you have to, but, but all the abstraction, all the ideas, all that kind of talk, it has to be so sparing, but it can never be on the nose. You have to always, those things that are, are legitimate in a work of art, only by the means of that great, that great and wonderful element of dramatic irony. That, the, that that whatever idea a character might float in the literary work, it, it has to be thrown to by the you have to make it so that it, that the reader thrums to it, not just in terms of the content of that idea, but more importantly, ah, that that character should be trying to understand his circumstances, his yearning in that ideational way. We respond to that by going by 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 understanding something about the deep emotional, non-rational character aspects of that character in in his trying to to sort the world out that way of abstractly. You follow that? All right. I, I think we have transitioned into questions and answers. So I am happy for that. Yes. Um, what would you say about this whole problem of cultural appropriation, of taking on the identity of somebody very other than you? Good question. Um, let, let me give you let me give you the, the, the deep answer first, but then the caveat must come after that. Okay? So remind me that it's caveat that I think you The deep answer is because what I'm about to say as a, 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 in, in support of some acts that might be called appropriation by artists, um, what I'm going to say uh, must be done by the artist under certain special circumstances. But ultimately, all art must, must engage our ability to do something that in a in a harsher, from a harsher perspective, is appropriation. If, because think of the reader. There's a reader who reads about some characters who are drastically different than themselves in the kind of demographic ways that we that we assign to appropriation and not appropriation. If a reader can come to a character that is quite different from oneself in, a, in those ways and have a profound enter into and inhabit that character and profoundly understand their own heart, deepest heart and soul, and their shared humanity by reading that work. From the reader's point of view, is that appropriation? How dare you understand yourself by reading that character quite different from yourself? No. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. That's what the artist offers. That the things that seem to divide us, those flashpoints, all that stuff, the things that seem to divide us are not nearly as deep and profound and, and defining as the world would have you think. That in fact, all that stuff is insignificant compared to, to what every soul on this planet shares, which is the human condition at its deepest level. 
So if a reader isn't appropriated by feeling, seeing their own humanity and the character on the page, it is possible for the artist to be in such a place that they might be able and can, and, and, and if they have a, a broad enough life experience, um, then, and, and the, uh, then it's almost you know, incumbent upon them, if that's where their inspiration is, to create characters that might be on the surface different. But if the artist is getting at that shared humanity and expressing that ultimately, then that's fine. In fact, that's admirable. The only problem then is the authenticity of the surface. But that's doable. And you know, you're asking, you're asking a guy, middle-aged white guy, I'm middle-aged, huh? <laughs> you're asking the old white guy. <laughs> yeah, it works, right? I am the, I'm the icon of passe here. You're asking me, who won a Pulitzer Prize writing a book of short stories, in the voices of Vietnamese exiles living in southern Louisiana, men and women, not young women. Now, it happens that when I was engaged with the U.S. Army in the middle of that war, they sent me to, um, uh, to Vietnam, but they did. First, they sent me to, uh, well, it's a military intelligence school. By the way, We've got minimal time to give this to others. I was in military intelligence. They treated me as a counterintelligence special agent. And then they sent me to language school. And so for an entire year, full time, I studied with a native speaker of Vietnamese and learned the Vietnamese language. Not an easy language to learn because of its tonality. It was musical enough, I could pick it up. When I landed in Vietnam in January 1971, I spoke fluent, I was speaking fluent Vietnamese. And on my second day in Vietnam, and I was, and I was working, I was sent out into the uh, uh, 25 miles east of Saigon to work a civilian closed job as a, with, under a guise of being a US Agency for International Development worker doing intelligence collection, in fact. But I had, ongoing close contacts with Vietnamese farmers, woodcutters, fishermen, police, provincial police chiefs, um, and, and all kinds of people. That, that was my experience in the first five months. By the way, but from my, on the second day, I, you know, the first day there that I began to do that stuff, I fell madly and deeply in love with, the, with, with Vietnam, its culture, its people, and so forth. And I Vietnamized myself. I spoke their language fluently. You know, these people, the Vietnamese people as a group, are amongst the warmest, most generous spirited people in the world. They invited me into their homes and into their culture and into their lives. I worked five months in the countryside in the way I just described. The unit stood down, it was 1971. I got picked up by a, I made a contact with an American Foreign Service officer who worked in the Saigon City, he was the advisor to the mayor of Saigon. He grabbed me up, made me his administrative assistant, sometimes translator. I lived in for my last seven months, again, civilian clothes, in an old French hotel in Saigon. Every night for those seven months, all, virtually every night at midnight, I'd wander, I'd leave my 38 in the bottom drawer, I'd wander unarmed, armed only with the Vietnamese language, into the steamy back alleys of Saigon where nobody ever seemed to sleep. And they too, they just invited me into their homes, astonished and thrilled. I worked with them. And I, uh, I spoke the language, and, and you know, I became them um, in the deep human ways. And so, and then it took. I did not write a good set from Strange Mountain for 18 years after I came home. But much, but, but it took that long for those folks to get out of my new memory and into my compost heap. And so all of a sudden, and I did not expect to write that book, but certain things happen, long stories, but I, you know, was. I wrote it because suddenly these voices started 
resurfacing. And they weren't the voices of people there, specific individuals, that's the point. They were reshaping and recombining into two dozen voices. Now, is that appropriation? And that, you know, that's, by the way, a little story. God, I'm going to ask question. That's right, go ahead. That's the creative process. But it's not the creative process if, unless, um, until, yeah, that's the creative process. But, you know, just having an intellectual or emotional love of somebody and, and then just kind of studying them and, and then, you know, writing in their, in their consciousness, it might not, then it, you might be willing those things too much. I mean, it took probably as much as that for me to be authentic. So are you saying that you feel a, the yearning for self and identity is stronger or more authentic than an individual yearning for God or yearning for a child or love, a deep love? It's, no, it's part of that. Those things. You yearn for God in order to, to answer the question of what is my place in the universe? You, you, so, you, do you ever really... I mean, that's... That? Those... It's, I mean, I, I mean, I'm talking about what's at the deepest level there, you know, you know, it, and um, and that that I mean, most of the most of the concepts of God in the established religions can be understood in in if if you believe in God, it, he's then or she or they or the ones who put that yearning in us to strive forward to find who we are. I mean, that's even built into the dog if you look at it closely enough. You know? Yearning for a child? Yeah, I mean, to, there's, at its depths, you define yourself. I, you know, you, uh, I mean, people even talk about it. You know, I, I was never a mother. I mean, that's a, well, that's, is, that's a sense of who you are. And we, 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 we see ourselves in our children, and we, and instinctively, we, we try to shape our child to, to become something of us and so forth. I mean, I think you can look at every one of those things and you can go on the list, but we can look at every one of them and say, yeah. And, and that doesn't discount that because those intermediary yearnings or desires, objectives, are, are just are absolutely legitimate in and of themselves. And there are outward reaching aspects to them. But they, but their deep roots, it seems to me, are down in who am I? That make sense? Yeah. Yes. Just a quick uh, question. It's, it's wonderful that we're talking about uh, these aspects of it. It's something I'd like to share. Um, when I taught you were from where you're doing all over the world for the past ten years. Um, it's a lot of things about you know, the nature of things that are ironic. Uh, is while all these sort of complex seeming things, uh, but for where you create has been the simplest, uh, easily approachable text or craft book, if you will, to teach in creative writing classes, composition classes, because students who come in and they write these stock phrases, great society and all that stuff, right, um, from Mississippi to rural India. So we um, give a case particularly important from where you're doing you have uh, this exercise called the sense journal. Mm -hmm. It's called the sense journal. Mm -hmm. And we assign them, I assign them the sensory journal, and immediately the writing is five or times better. Students don't want to do it. Um, students don't want to you know, go up and revisit a place at a time. They're quickly, what the sensory journal is, is where students look back on their life or past experience relate it moment to moment and, and express it through the senses. Uh, through the senses. And you know, it's a very brief assignment, but all these complex sounding things, when they're well down to the senses, for students, again, you know, mentioning this is being you have to um, just kind of indicate the yeah. age. Doesn't matter what their identity is, doesn't matter whether they went to school um, meeting English as the first language in the United States, or they're in rural India. They learn English as a second language. It makes no difference. They're fantastic in terms of accessing the senses. I and mean, one of the reasons I think that works for them in that way, these are undergraduate students. 
uh, love lines with very little sort of instructional experience or not too much baggage. That is one of the reasons why I think those sort of sets rates for the basic calls that you're talking about are, are easier for them to get to. It's universal, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that, that, we all move through the world in exactly that way. Yeah, you know, thank you for that. That's yeah, and I'm delighted it's helpful to you. Um, absolutely. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you say you know you write from kind of one's white hot center. I want to know what does it look like to revise from that white hot center. Very good question. That's what, here's where here's where your your good novel is bad memory comes into play. And mine is so bad, I'm able to kind of revise as I go. I forget my sentences almost as I write them. But to whatever extent, you know, but a lot of people have to put a first draft away for a little bit to come back to it for a good reason. I mean, that's a good impulse. You go back, you, you let enough time pass so that you you forget why you've done things, you anything. And if you're writing from the right place, there was no why, except it was just felt like the right thing. And that's even better. But if you've willed it in, it makes it more difficult because you forget the will, but but you need to be able to then come back to the work as in some way as if you, you're engaging somebody else's work. And what you've got to do is, without any expectations of it, try to you reread the passage, you reread the story or whatever the book, and you do it the way you're supposed to read literature. Thrum, 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 twang. Whoa. When you hit the twang, and you hit the twang because something's wrong there. The revision process is what you do not do, which is which is implied again in a lot of what you learn. It's now, it is not now time to put aside what the process, the initial process was. It, it is and, and to now exercise your analytical ability and your knowledge of craft and technique figure out what's wrong and to willfully fix it by the light of that technical insight. No, what you do is you take the passage, set it aside, and you redream it. Rewriting is redreaming. Revision is redreaming. You go back to that unconscious, you go back to your compost heap, your white hot center, and, and that's the place that generates the fix. <laughs> because it's likely that the reason you have to have something to fix is you fell out of that place to begin with. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yes. Sort of main efficiency. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You go, then it's something that it's not, it's, it, you fall out of the senses, you fall out of the, uh, you know, the, the moment to moment. You, you're, 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 you're pushing elements in that do not have the kind of resonant, organic connection to everything else. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes. I like to think here how you do your workshop differently. Because, I mean, I agree. Yeah. Nobody talks with me. <laughs> you are not under any compulsion to criticize each other. If you want to do that, do it in the coffee shop later and be careful. Plus, I am a great believer. There, you know, the uh, James Joyce epiphany that occurs at the end of the short story or something shines forth in its essence. I would argue that in every work of fiction, no matter how short or long, there is another epiphany in every legitimately realized work of art, and that the first epiphany in the work, which occurs probably within the first five to an, and, and to almost any really astute reader, it's going to occur within the first 500 words or so of the story. And that first epiphany is the epiphany of yearning. You enter in, you inhabit the character, and because nobody's sitting there analyzing for you, not telling you, okay, he sure wishes he knew who he was, no. That's not the way it goes. It's embedded in the moment-to-moment -moment sensual flow, and, and at some point that begins to build up and there's this little flash of, you settle into the character, sensing the character in his or her own terms, 
her, her quest to know who she really is, right? So I work with the first 500 words first. We, we only, every week we do, I don't know how many, but we, uh, you know, we have, see there's 10 people in the, in the workshop, and um, everybody brings in the first 500 words of a work of fiction. Could complete short, short stories. And short shorts are really just the first epiphany. That's, that's, that's the final epiphany and the first epiphany occur at the same time. A legitimate story, short, short story. But, and um, we circulate, and then um, I, I work through as many as I can get in a three hour session, and we say, okay, so and so. And we, we all sit and just read to ourselves. And then I, I will discourse on it about whatever I see that might be useful, but ultimately I'm looking for was there a yearning here or not? And if there wasn't, fine. Put it away, never look at this again, and next week you bring in another first five numbers. When we have a breakthrough and we have, yes, there's a yearning, here's the yearning, here's how it worked, that writer then has the option the next week to bring in the next five or six or eight hundred words. And they go forward. I have to warn you, this is a brutally difficult process. My, my graduate workshops. Mostly have PhD students in them. At the end of the semester, I've got 10 people. I'm lucky if four have gotten the journey in the first. But the struggle toward it is really useful. I've got so much bad, you know, misbegotten process to clear out of their brains. That's why. These are really talented writers. One of my students won his own Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. I mean, there, there are coming me from because I'm very well right. In fact, over in my Charles, I was a student when I was in the news. And so, I mean, it happens. But this is a this is, you know, I I take their highest ambition very seriously, and that requires no compromise in, in, in what they have to establish as their process. And by the way, I think the work the book is more is not craft as much as it is process, and that's the point. It's not I appreciate the compliment, but it's, it's uh, you know it's a better way to probably speak of the work to your even to your students. Right? It's not craft. This is not craft. There are craft implications. A teacher like you can draw some craft um, notations from it, but it's really about process, and that, it's process that's the problem. Yes, one last question. I think right. How are you know, two eighteen? We're supposed to, are they, are they trying to take the room away from us right away, or? 2.30. Oh, well, let's, let's take another few minutes, if you like. That's the value of this order, but yes, what's your question? So you, you say this is most suited for literary writing, but then they can also say that your dance themes and uh, symbols and, uh, and writing shouldn't be in their head, but that seems to be part of what most literary but then you see, but but you've been conditioned by the literature classes you take to say that. And that, yeah, it seems to be that's what they're about because that's the ways in which they have been described to you as as a process of understanding. So, but the, what I'm suggesting is is pretty radical as a person, and so I maybe that's the best. Okay, one last question. <coughs> well, don't you see again? That's that that comes from that old impulse. The yearning is not the theme. Forget theme. Never think about theme again. <laughs> it, it, from, as a writer, it just it's not a a theme. Is like a kind of what's like a fortune cookie, a, 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 a kind of advanced fortune cookie. This is the theme of the book. That, you know, people need to be nice to each other. Whatever it is, you know it. It, the yearning is not the theme. The yearning is the it is is the funny fundamental principle that is the essence of literary narrative. Really the end, no, no, no. It has to be there from the from the get go. You know. There, you know, the, the the fact the first epiphany I was talking about is if is is a, a, the reader's consciousness. 
conscious, you know, low consciousness of inhabiting the character at that level. It's feeling that that character, the character's yearning, striving for a sense of who she is and, and where her, what she, where she belongs in the universe. That's that that's what you that's where you inhabit her. You inhabit the journey she takes. Okay. If you want to think of the yearning, think of it as journey. I'm not thinking. But, but it's not fulfilling and necessary. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Depends on again how. Remember back to chaos, and you have a vision that there's that there's artists that thinks that there's actually order behind the chaos. Your vision of order may be maybe a dark vision. It may mean, you know, that we are just all through. That is how we are, you know, and, and that all the all the ways in which we can seem to find our way toward a self, ultimately, for whatever reason, the universe is going to pull the rug out from us, even at the very end. You know. If that's and I and what I just what I just said to you, you see, even teaching makes you talk like that. <laughs> because what I just described is a human love is a theme in a, in a book. You see what I'm saying? Forget everything I said today. Wait a minute. And uh, yes. Can you actually start? A novel and talk to someone who was born, like from when they're a little child, and all the way up and create that sense of yearning in the first time. Well, that's why I'm so that's why I'm so depressed at the moment because that the novel I just described to you is exactly what I'm doing. 115 and a half years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, absolutely. All righty, folks. Thank you.